My name is Dell, and I'm a full-time day trader and educator over at ActiveTraders.chat. I'm proud to announce a new series, Bear vs. Pig, candid interviews with micro to small cap stock traders. Unlike any other series you'll hear online, it's not catered towards beginners, and we are exploring a very specific niche in stock trading. This is a series of interviews with seasoned day traders who have found themselves trading inside one of the stock market's most volatile and shrouded niches. Let's lift the veil and begin exploring the minds behind this niche. So first off, I want to say that I'm overwhelmed by the amount of support and positive feedback this podcast has received from the community. Um, I believe that to become a great trader, it's incredibly important to actively seek to improve and challenge your own trading strategy and assumptions about the market. And in the spirit of this, I want to continue to bring guests on that have new and interesting perspectives in this niche and also in this profession in general. So I want to thank you all for your support. On today's episode, we have Michael Spinoza. Part of the Foos4 trading team, Mike is a successful trader from New York who trades low float, small cap stocks. Now, on previous episodes, we've covered a lot of ground on the technical and fundamental aspects of trading, uh, but today we'll be focusing more on the psychological angle, the routine, the mental strength and stamina that it takes to make well-rounded, logical decisions day after day in the markets, despite sometimes being under an absurd amount of stress. So many traders, including myself, pride themselves on the ability to understand the market from a technical perspective. But each and every one of us knows that it's the ability to understand buyers and sellers from a behavioral perspective that gives us the edge in a highly emotional market situation. So let's pick Mike's brain and see how he has developed the ability to introspect so effectively. So welcome to episode three of Bear vs. Pig. Uh, On today's show, we have Michael Spinoza. Is that how I say your last name? Yes. Excellent. Uh, You may know him as uh, Big Mike or at Foos4Mike on Twitter. Uh, Mike has been trading for the past four years and you may have seen him uh, more famously alongside Cameron Foos uh, and Robert Millar as part of the Foos4 trading team. And he's currently uh, director of trading at Foos4 Trading. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for joining me and welcome to Bear vs. Pig. Thank you for having me, brother. Honored. Excellent. Well, I do want to start picking your brain. Um, and uh, we have talked about what we could put on this episode. Uh, the community has also talked about things that they wanted to hear. Uh, you're starting to make a name for yourself in, 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 the, in just the, the DMs that I've been talking uh, with people about. Is You're starting to make a name for yourself in thinking a little bit differently than everybody else. Um, and I've noticed that in the videos that you post on YouTube... Uh, these really helpful walkthroughs of the market and um, that you talk a lot about psychology and human behavior. Um, So I know you're super excited to talk about that and I'm really excited to hear about it. And I know that we have some questions lined up uh, along those lines from the community as well. So why don't you just uh, just give us a quick um, intro into what you want to talk about and then we'll start diving into your personal background first. Yeah. So, you know, like we were talking about before this, um, just giving back to the community, my goal here is to try and simplify the market for everyone because it can be overwhelming. Um, And I think by narrowing it down to an emotional or psychological standpoint by trying to think as, as if you were a buyer or a seller, that's kind of helped me significantly because um, that flows into your psychology and, and which bias you are. Um, you know, we talk about all the time on Twitter being long bias or short bias. And um, the quicker that you can realize which bias is taking trend, the quicker you're going to be successful in trading. And um, that comes down to your emotions, you know, and um, being able to identify that. So for me, that's kind of helped me um, ignore a lot of the noise and just focus on what I'm thinking at the moment. And um, also simplifying technicals down in terms of not using a lot of indicators. Um, you know, that just really helped me. So that's what I kind of want to help everyone start to think like, as opposed to um, 
just looking at the market as some type of chart, you know, or just some type of uh, price. And and I think makes- a lot of people are sort of expect to learn a pattern or find an indicator and then be able to figure out the market and be able to make money out of it. I know that's what I expected when I started trading. Definitely. That's what I expected as well. And so when I hear you talking about how important psychology and human behavior is, I mean, I totally agree with you, but I'm also guilty of putting so much emphasis on the technical aspect of things when there's so much to unpack when it comes to psychology and human behavior. Yeah. I mean, um, I learned technicals from Foos um, because my whole upbringing was fundamental um, as well as, I guess, momentum trading. Some of these larger cap names like GoPro, Twitter, um, when I was an advisor. So that helped me understand fundamentals. And when I realized that you can't predict price action from fundamentals in the short term, that's what made me interested in technicals. And then once I learned the technical aspect, I realized that that works. But it, like Foos and I say all the time, knowing a pattern is like looking at a flashcard um, and actually performing what you need to do when that pattern exists is a totally separate thing, which comes down to pure emotions, I feel like. Absolutely. I'm totally on board with that. And I do want to continue unpacking that. But first, let's, you know, get to know you a little bit. Let's dive a little bit into your personal background. Um, Where do you live? Where did you grow up? I grew up in New York. I live in Long Island. Uh, My whole life I've been here. So I'm a uh, East Coast kid. Um, My parents are Italian, Irish and German. So that's that's, uh, my makeup. (laughs) And um, yeah, I'm just a young Italian kid, and I've um, kind of came from an old school Italian family. Um, they're all here on Long Island, so I kind of um, very close to home all the time, you know. And did you um, were you always into finance, even at, like at a young age, or did you have some other sort of uh, career that is, does not relate at all? Basically, I was my grandfather was um, into the stock market, and um, I'd say by like 16. I was kind of getting involved, putting like small dollar amounts into like random stocks, you know, just and just trying to understand how to make money um, with zero education, you know, just kind of throwing darts. And um, he got me into it. So he was uh, the risk taker in my family, which um, I think rubbed off on me at a young age uh, because basically I got to see what the market could do. You know, that's the greatest wealth creation vehicle out there. I think that in real estate. So, um, once you see what I can do, I think most people get, you know, it could become an addiction. <laughs> so it's safe yeah. to say that it was an addiction for me at a young age. That can be a good thing, you know, cause a lot of, I know a lot of my friends and especially the people that I, that I know have, will never understand what I do or why I do it. Yeah. Uh, they just don't have the drive, um, that, that I do. Um, and so I search and look for people that have that drive and, you know, I've been following you for a long time. I know you have that drive. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. And, uh, so I want to un- unpack that a little bit, like what drove you uh, towards, uh, finance. You said it was your, your grandfather that instilled that risk taking, uh, in yeah. you. So I was thinking about this before, cause you sent me some questions and, um, for me, like a young kid, I was, I had my first job at age 12 and I was always working. Um, I was always doing like some type of intra, intramural or, or after school activity, you know, and um, was always active. So that I was kind of a natural competitor. And then when I went to college, my first year was actually physical therapy. And because I liked the idea of it, like I was big into working out and, um, you know, that type of stuff. So then I realized within the first year that I completely hated it because it was all like, bio classes and chemistry and, and I didn't understand any of it. So um, I remember calling my mom and being like, I need to just drop out of school and join the union. You know, I have friends making like 70 grand a year, which I thought was so much back then, you know, and she basically shut that down real quick. And then uh, I changed my major to finance. Um, and then that's where I kind of learned fundamentals and everything. And then I started to it's the education aspect grew on me because I guess I knew about the market, but like maybe I thought it was sort of luck, you know, um, at a young age, like my grandfather, um, when I was going to college, I remember he gave me three grand of, of his money and he said, gave me a couple of stocks to buy for him and I bought them. And I remember it was like bank of America at like three bucks and like, um, 
Ford at like three or four bucks. And then within a couple of years, you know, that money turned from like three grand into like nine or 10 because all of those, you know, those stocks bottomed out big time. And um, I saw what can happen, you know, like with money just sitting there. And then he basically turned around and said to me, like, that's your money now. And um, that's when I really, you know, um, start to take finance seriously. But I will say that my problem with college is that it didn't teach anything about trading or technical analysis. And the college was almost, I went to Quinnipiac uh, up in Connecticut, and they were very, um, I guess you could say risk averse, trying to teach the students that type of stuff. So um, I wanted to take the whole route of like being an analyst or some type of like you work at a big bank. Um, which I found out pretty quick after college was, you know, mm -hmm. it's all, uh, it's not everything is cracked up to be. And being an analyst, how long did you do that job for? About six months. Um, basically, just to give everyone an idea about, I always had discipline and drive. And um, I had an internship as an analyst junior year of college. Um, I had my series seven before I graduated college. And then, um, when I graduated, I had that analyst job guaranteed coming out, which was pretty nice. And it was for a small cap and micro cap research firm, mm -hmm. um, which like, I didn't even think it would, it would lead to where I am now, you know, which is why it's pretty funny. Um, but I had to take my series 86 and then my 87, I failed the first time. And I remember um, six months into the job, I was just really depressed and not into it at all. Um, and I told myself, if I don't pass it, then it's just because this isn't for me and I, I didn't pass it and then ended up leaving that job. Um, I was trying to, and then spent three or four months trying to figure out where I wanted to go, which is kind of, which is definitely, um, you know, an, an eye opener. Well, I mean, going from being an analyst and having a, a guaranteed job when you get out of school, uh, to becoming a day trader, I still think is a big leap. Yeah. Well, I was actually, so I'll give you the time frame in between there. So three to four months, I was just searching for different opportunities that were very entrepreneurial. So I was kind of in that risk taking mode because I saw that the corporate world was just like long hours and, and honestly low wage relative to the work and work ethic you put in, you know, like mm -hmm. I was get, getting like 60 K a year out of college, which was amazing at the time. But I realized very quick, like it doesn't matter how much money you're making. If you're miserable, it's, it's a big deal. So, um, I was just trying to find something that I loved and, um, wanted to get involved with the market a little bit. So I became an advisor where I did more money management. And that kind of just taught me market structure. Um, I was buying stocks like Apple and Facebook and doing a GoPro and a little bit of short selling. So I learned market structure, but nothing about technicals. And then um, got to the point where I just wanted to trade my own money and see if I could do it, which kind of led to where I am now. Um, but that was kind of my whole path before I started to day trade. Um, sometimes people ask me if it helped. You know, I guess it was just, it helped in that I started to understand market structure, but I knew nothing about day trading. Uh, and being an analyst, I guess you also knew that in this small to micro cap world that there's stocks that, you know, maybe shouldn't be up as much as they are. Basically, yeah. I found the, what I can take away from that job is that there's zero correlation between fundamentals and price in the small cap world in the short term, I should say, because, um, you know, you've seen what can happen. Like the, you, I saw you, one of the stocks, of course, AWX. Um, that's just a perfect example, right? Mm -hmm. It's the, the one black swan event that could take you out of the game. So, um, you know, that, that validates that there's really no correlation in the short term, which goes to technicals and, you know, why I'm basically pure technical trader at this point. Wow. Oh, so, so you're saying that despite being an analyst and knowing all, everything you do, uh, that, the technical side of things it still has more sway because of the how irrational that yeah. small cap market is. Yes, like uh, my whole first year, I did not look at fundamentals and stocks. It was pure technicals, and um, I only longed, and I still had just as much success. Uh, I, do I look at fundamentals now? Yes, but I feel like everyone can, so there's less edge in them. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about like specific stocks, you know, but like. Mm -hmm. PTIE was one that everyone knew was a trash stock and they had um, some type of ATM or they, they needed cash and that thing ripped, you know, 100% plus in a day. So um, that's the question is, are, fun, are fundamentals an edge anymore because anybody can figure them out? You know, I'm looking, um, 
to just really analyze more of technicals and more of supply and demand imbalance and volume as opposed to focusing on how fundamentally trash a company is. Okay, so I definitely want to get to some of that stuff as well. Yeah, uh, but we let's can, uh... just continue a little bit on, on the on the professional background. Yeah. Um, so at some point in your journey, you decided to become a day trader or, or take a shot at it. And then you ran into um, Cameron at some point. Can you walk us through how that relationship unfolded? Yeah, so basically um, I was at my job as an advisor and I remember trying to find another route and I was on social media and came across his page and basically saw that he had a great lifestyle and then saw that he day traded with uh, technical analysis, which I was trying to figure out at the time. And I basically purchased his DVDs and I know everyone, you know, the, the training and everyone has their own, but it helped me dramatically because it basically just taught me um, triangle breakouts, you know, from like mm -hmm. the basic and that's what I did my whole first year was basically momentum longing. And um, I was very successful at it. Um, I didn't short at all my first year. So um, I still love longing to this day. But that he basically introduced me to that and then asked me to join the team because it was just him and Rob at the time. And um, I joined and now I'm basically working there and um, you know doing the live stream, trying to I do the mentorship three times a week with uh, some of our members and just try and show people um, both sides, so long and short. So we all just work together now, I think for about maybe two years, three years. That's amazing. And, you know, I, I mean, I also do live streaming. And one thing I love about it is that I feel accountable every single day. Yeah, it's definitely, um, it's cool to, I mean, you, it's pure transparency, right? So it's, I think it's a lot easier to do that than um, than to type out um, getting into trades for sure. I call it getting butterfingers where I'm trying to type out <laughs> and it's just the whole message comes out or the ticker comes out wrong. So it's a lot easier to do it that way for sure. Very cool. Um, so you're, you're live streaming, um, in a room for about, I think you said about five days a week. Uh, yeah, we do the live stream. So what we usually do to try and teach people the right way is if the day is super slow, then we don't do live stream because like lately, you know, the, the market's been, uh, summer trading you know it's the lull starts early so um if it's hot and we're making trades then we do the live stream especially now we're doing it for a super affordable price and um at mm -hmm. this point we're just trying to build a community you know as opposed to uh like we were talking about how the whole industry is changing yeah yeah that's what it's about i mean i saw that you're offering it for you know a temporary price of, i think of 99 dollars yeah so maybe you can walk us through, I know we're not going to get too much into your strategies and, your, and all that, um, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about your decision making process and yeah. uh, you, you kind of alluded and talked a little bit about what you focused on, but what is your decision making process consist of right now in the market so that we can get a snapshot of that before moving on? In terms of what types of stocks I trade? Or, yeah, what um, kind of stocks do you trade? Do you, will you put yourself inside of a niche? Yeah, I would say I trade most basically mostly small caps, um, anything under two billion market cap, um, and ideally something that's thirty million float and below would basically be my niche. Um, and I'm looking to basically long consolidation uh, plays or short stocks that are overextended on the daily chart. Because um, I know on on social media I might identify as a short seller, but um, I long probably maybe 40% of the time and then short 60. So definitely willing to play both sides. And that's sort of comes naturally to you because if you're, because you, you started longing, you said you'd love longing, right? So I guess it's really hard to just give it up. I think really I'm a huge believer that you need to learn that first to be a short than then to short because sometimes I look at my charts lately and my, um, like your your cells and your longs should look like your entries on your shorts, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And um, once they start to look like that, you can't tell. I feel like that's when you know you're doing it right. Um, okay, so you've got your niche. You're trading these small cap stocks. You know, you're live streaming. You're helping the community. Um, and I've seen that your videos on YouTube, uh, you're especially I think you're one of your last ones, um, is talking a lot about um, focusing from now on, on psychology and human behavior. Um, so maybe walk us through why that's important. Well, I guess we can start with how 
this niche has gotten relatively crowded and that a lot of people know about it. So these small caps and their volatility, um, if you try and use too, I guess, too tight of risk, then you know they, it can shake you out. So when I started to think about what other people are thinking, um, you know, if I'm looking to short a stock, I'm thinking what are longs thinking, and if I'm looking to long a stock, I start to think about what are shorts thinking, because um, this has allowed me to not focus as much on the chart because the chart lately, like it, let's say you're looking for um, some type of ascending triangle breakout on a long side, that can quickly turn into a short, just based off pure psychology and what buyers and sellers are thinking, you know, and it helped me not really focus on the one minute moves, you know, and, and get shaken out and started to really ease up and just watch um, and try and get a feel on the stock. Because the truth is that the, mar the technical analysis is an illustration of human behavior is how I look at it, right? Um, so the sooner you can figure out what other humans are thinking, the better, the, the more easily that stock's going to be to trade. And do you think that when people learn technical analysis and that they put enough emphasis on the understanding be human behavior part? No, they don't. They just think it's a pattern and that it should work out the way that the textbook teaches it. That's what I, because that's what I thought at first. So then what kind of problems do people run into when they're trying to uh, trade without uh, understanding that behavior part? I think that this is where biases come into play and that, um, this is where you know this can get into some deep conversation talking about like the most successful traders um have been masters of like yoga and self-awareness so the sooner you can figure out what you're thinking at that time and what you want out of a certain trade i think will help you identify what other people are thinking um i think people don't give stocks enough wiggle room is the truth like um Everyone wants to know like a definitive, I call this the d definitive answer bias, where people ask for definitive answers all the time in trading, like where should I enter, where should I exit, and I always talk about a zone, um, like a 10 to 20 cent zone, because no one's ever right, like from a def like an exact price zone, you know, um, and the sooner you can accept that, like you're never going to top tick and bottom tick. Anytime people do, it's always just because that's where they were planning on getting in anyway. Um, so I think people don't give these small caps enough wiggle room and they get shaken out easily, you know, or, um, you know, just based off the low float, you know, we've seen what can happen with AWX when um, someone decides to change the game and buy up the whole float, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, when that manipulation comes in, then it's a, a true test there, right? To see who and can. So that's basically, you know, going back to, because you mentioned about what I was talking about in the video. If you're thinking about other buyers and sellers from an emotional standpoint and behavioral standpoint, in AWX, you could tell that somebody was constantly buying that stock. So anyone that was watching that tape for that, that whole like week, you could have, I mean, I knew it. Everyone else knew that someone mm -hmm. was a heavy buyer. So like, do people think that those shares naturally just get sold? That guy has to sell eventually, right? So that's how I start to think about stocks um, in terms of, you know, behavior. Not, you know, that was just... Obviously, you know, maybe one individual. We don't have to say names, but you try and think of what the the behavior and buyers or sellers are thinking. It's definitely it makes sense to me, at least. I think that AWX stock was probably one of the most obvious manipulation. Yeah, that was probably the most obvious. <laughs> yeah, I, I've never seen anything like that. You know, just as you, just to the point where you're about to click that, you know, add more to that short position button. You know, it's 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 about to roll over or this number that everybody's been watching. That's when it gets bought up and spiked hard and people are put upside down instantly that haven't given the stock enough wiggle yeah, I mean, room. I, yeah. Between me and you, I was at a I didn't trade it at all. And I, um, that day they were had I think it was Friday. I remember I was at a bar with my buddy and I remember pulling out my phone and I saw it at 13 after hours and I was cracking up because I was not shocked, to be honest. Yeah. But I knew to, I knew to stay away just because of. When you see someone that's doing stuff like that, like those are the stocks you want to avoid. Um, and when people start to realize like that's actually a person or a group of people out there doing that, it's not just like um, it's a Fugazi type thing from like Wolf of Wall Street, you know, then you mm -hmm. that's what makes sense to me. 
um, and I can you easily start to realize when stocks get crowded because you you realize that there's certain things you can look at I guess from um, a behavior standpoint that you know that helps me trade better and can help everyone else trade better as well yeah and you can really see the emotional and intensity in a stock like that especially as it does take those uh, crushing squeezes um, and so I think this it's a good time to talk about some of the biases that you had mentioned in your previous videos yeah uh, you, you mentioned anch anchoring bias and cognitive yeah. bias so can you take us through that yeah so I mean cognitive bias is just the generic term for as a human when you're just a one-sided belief in something and then under cognitive biases there's endless amounts of different biases that people can have right so and that's where we're flawed as traders is that we have all these different emotions and biases whereas like algos don't right so anchoring is basically for example if you go on twitter and you see the first article on a stock or the first opinion on a stock and that immediately sets that sets your your belief on a stock and then you basically gravitate towards that belief and that builds you know like if you see some type of uh article that's long bias a stock and you immediately are long bias that's anchoring because you're gravitating towards that one piece of information if that makes sense yeah it does it <laughs> totally makes sense um and but that's just one um example of it and there's tons um like loss aversion is one where people um are basically more comfortable taking avoiding losses they'd rather take the loss and they sell the gains early um, so these are different things that you, know, you could read a ton of books on it. Like if I could help anybody, um, this, uh, what's it called? Trading in the zone by Mark Douglas and the disciplined trader by Mark Douglas. Great books. I, I could, yeah, th those set my emotional structure, um, and helped me realize biases that I had, um, because everyone suffers from different ones and everybody's different. So the key is you need to figure out and everyone else needs to figure out what's their natural bias. For me, I had some loss aversion where I'd sell my winners too early and I'd let my losses um, get too big. Yeah, that was the exact problem I had as well. I, I read those, yeah. especially trading the zone. I read that when I was trading yeah, that's futures. Like a, that's a classic, that one. And, and, you know, honestly, like people will hear about the psychology side of things um, and they'll hear people rant about it but it's always out of context and i always find that a little troubling and what i really yeah. like about your video is you're starting to talk through in context how these biases can affect you while you're inside of a trade so awx is a beautiful example of all these biases starting to stack up on top of each other and people starting to become irrational how does somebody defend against that i guess from you know um from my experience you have to you have to go through those losses to help you learn a way to defend against it because you don't know a bias exists i guess until it becomes conscious and a loss makes it conscious you know it brings it from your subconscious to your conscious level so i think that the loss has helped me realize and be able to identify those emotions quicker you know um because you can tell people about it but until they go through it it won't i guess transfer to their conscious level where they'll be self-aware of it mm -hmm. um so, so now that i've gone through certain losses and certain gains um you go through those emotions and then when that happens over and over again i think you become um you're in a, you can identify them quicker over time and have you ever had any bone crushing uh losses um not, that's what I kind of pride myself on is like my biggest loss ever in a day was like 15 grand and I ended up making it back that same day. Um, I've kept my losses relatively small and that's what I kind of pride myself on is I've never had a huge blow up trade. Um, and I think that's because as an advisor, I've seen, I, I've seen what can happen when you, um, you know, if you don't have a stop in, right? Like you can survive in this game as long as you keep those losses small. So um, I'm pretty disciplined about doing that. And um, I don't mind taking a couple small, couple thousand dollar losses, but I'll never let my position get to a, you know, a point where I'm down five figures and I'm still adding, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and another question I have for you that I've asked the previous guests as well is, how do you go about position sizing um, or, or scaling in? 
Um, yeah. And we also had a question from somebody on Twitter that asked about increasing size. So maybe we can yeah. lump those together and talk about that. Yeah. Um, so the size is just going to come with time. You know, like when I, my first year I was trying to do like, I mean, like when I left my job and um, knew that I wanted to day trade, um, basically there was three things that I knew I had to figure out. It was finding a trading vehicle, which was stocks, finding a strategy, which I had from Foos, and finding a time horizon. Um, so I basically, my time horizon was a day and I figured out, okay, if I can do a thousand bucks a week, like I'll be okay. So my first year I was only doing a couple thousand shares per position, um, and still was having great gains. So, but even still like my first year, if I would take like, you know, a thousand dollar loss, I would hate life. <laughs> so, <laughs> but by having, by going through that, you know, those loss, small losses now and uh, going through the small size, if you're a natural competitor, you'll want to up your size. Um, I think it's definitely harder for, you know, maybe it's a lot harder for some people and easier for other people. But um, I was always a natural competitor. So once I got used to a certain size, I always wanted to try more, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think everyone should want to push for size because I've had this conversation with a couple of trading buddies and um, – Size can be overrated and that you, size is what can make one out, trading outlier take you out of the game. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? Whereas, yeah, the consistency is what it's about, right? Um, and I've learned that for me personally, like I can't stomach um, huge swings. I'd prefer the consistency and the risk management, even though the consistency can still be phenomenal when the small gains add up. So I think size can be a little overrated. If you have the cushion to push the size, then by all means. But I don't think everyone should be in such a rush to push size. I started to push size once I found consistency, which is probably like the past year and a half. That you know, finding consistency is the number one hardest thing, I think, for yeah. traders. People don't really understand that it's the consistency that they really, really want. Um, and, and I know that for my, the traders that I, um, help coach and mentor, I tell them just taste that consistency, you know, just stick to something yeah. long enough to get a little bit of that consistency. And you're going to be searching for that for the rest of your trading career. Yeah, it's true because, and to back the consistency up is where you need the journaling to prove it. I think, um, because people can think they're consistent, right. Until you, you break that down into stats. And once you see all that, um, I don't know if you wanted to talk about that as well, journaling. Yeah, I, I, I wrote down journaling as one of the things to chat about because I think it's something that we haven't really chatted about. Yeah. Um, and it, it really does fit well into, you know, the whole process of trading. Um, but just before we get into that, I want, I want to ask you one more thing about size is, yeah. so we talked about increasing in size and we talk, talked about risk a bit. Um, what about um, scaling into a trade? Do you scale yeah, into actually, trades or do you go full size? Yes. Now, so that's a huge thing. I'm glad you brought that up because everyone that's trading size is usually scaling because in this like small cap world, everyone, if you're trading size, people are going to know if you're just going to enter, you know, all at once, right? So that's, that goes back to the whole human behavior. Um, when people start showing size is when you can start to get a tell on a stock and most people don't want that. So, um, I'll, I start to scale in and, um, basically why I love that strategy now is because I'll scale in a starter size and then, um, give the stock so much wiggle room that I don't care if it goes like a buck or two bucks against me because it's such small size. Right. And then once I start to see the confirmation is when you start to continue to scale in, and that goes back to accepting, and this goes back to like trading in the zone, um, that you're never going to be able to time a stock to the perfect, to the T. So scaling is what accepts, is where you're accepting that, right? Because you know you're not going to be right. So um, you don't full boat a position all at once. And usually when you're inside of a trade and you're starting to scale in, this is what I do as well as a scaling. I find that um, I get to a point where I, I'm sort of at a crossroads. Like, do I go beyond the size now and really uh, load up, or do I pull back and you know look for patience? Yeah. So for I've I've realized that I'm usually not adding until I get that confirmation of the backside. 
Um, but for, for in terms of me, my size is already premeditated. I know what level I want to get to. I'm just waiting for the stock to confirm that for me. So some of it's a little providing liquidity, you know, and um, I've gotten to the point where I feel comfortable throwing orders out there. And if they get filled, then I'm comfortable with the risk, you know, um, if that makes any sense. Like the problem is that with scaling, people want a definitive stop. And sometimes it's a lot of feeling out, you know, as opposed to like, I'm looking at this specific level, which is where, you know, tape reading comes into play. And then how do you manage your risk when you're scaling in, you know, at so many different places? How do you, how do you keep yourself from going beyond what you're hoping to risk my max by because my max risk when on my like my startup position would be like 2500 shares and i'll give it 1500 dollars worth of risk so on a you know on any price stock that's at least small caps that can be like a buck or two um you know about 80 cents or so so um i don't mind being in the red for a little bit of time usually the the more i'm in the red is when i realize is that's when i'm more right <laughs> then, uh, you know, like that's where I should be adding. So I've gotten comfortable doing that. And that's, you know, accepting that I'm really not going to find the top. I'm just looking for a certain zone. And then the level two will usually tell the story when you see sellers come in, you know, and you see some type of a huge candle where, you know, a lot of people are, under, are underwater. You know, if people chased it, this is where like psychology comes into play um, that I don't mind starting to full boat it. As long as I have a def like a, a defined risk point, you know, um, I'm not really full boating it until I have that defined risk point. But usually, there's a lot of scale again before that, you know. Uh, so a lot of this is affected by, as a trader, affected by the level of confidence that we have inside of the setups, and then the confidence that we have to continue adding to a trade despite it going a little bit into the red. So let's talk about confidence a little bit, uh, and that goes. I think we can loop in journaling there. And we can yeah. talk a little bit about journaling. So let me ask you the broad question. How do you go about increasing your confidence? So basically, I think this can also flow with a little bit of daily routine. So like, because I'll start my day out. Um, I get up like four or five in the morning and I'm usually doing some type of like morning cardio. And that gets my head right, which flows into my confidence in the day. Um, because I feel a lot sharper, you know, and... Um, emotionally aware and self-aware as opposed to like rolling out of bed you know and like just walking up to the grabbing a cup of coffee and maybe that works for some people but like usually if i don't work out the morning of there's like a 60 percent chance we have a red day <laughs> so like the confidence comes from my daily routine as well as uh, my journaling which has like we talked about before um, validated my consistency and that you know the data speaks for itself i guess people can say that they're confident but if you see your data the data is going to tell you the numbers and, and tell you the true story you know well you know and it, it goes a lot to say about the the industry because you, people people learn these patterns like we talked about and they expect them to work and when they don't they either blame themselves or somebody else um but really um it it goes towards increasing that level of confidence um, and like you said, you know, having that daily routine, doing the same thing every single day is is key, but then also journaling is super key. So what data do you collect and what data is most important to you to help with that confidence or inconsistency? So I basically, I'm a big believer in focusing on what you're good at and just completely ignoring what you're either like mediocre or like horrible at trading. So I don't focus too much. My journaling is going to tell me my trading statistics and that I should avoid the lull. I'm better off, you know, locking in my gains in the morning, you know, and um, I'll usually fade stocks or, you know, I'll trade them in the afternoon, but um, locking in the gains in the morning, you know, it's going to, the data and the journaling will tell you stuff like that. In terms of patterns, I, and without getting into, I guess, too much detail, try to find certain correlations between patterns, the patterns that I like to trade and um, a certain, you know, fundamentals behind each company. So that are, that are not very generic, that are not like hidden fundamentals, but this allows me to, like when my uh, scanner is up in the morning, I can immediately tell you like within 
four to five seconds of stocks that I'm ignoring just based off of one fundamental uh, thing, one fundamental variable, just because I know that I'm not good at trading those. Not that it's not tradable, just know that I can't, I'm not statistically as good. So um, this, by by only trading stocks that you know you're good at, this is where the confidence comes into play, right? When I'm trading these triple levered ETFs, I have zero yeah. confidence. <laughs> so, you know, and um, that's where you treat trading like a business, right? And I think um, the confidence too comes with, as the sooner you can create structure in your own trading environment to minimize your emotions, the better. Because the emotions are the 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 wild card, right? I think that's what most people can't control. And sometimes I have trouble controlling it. So I try and minimize those emotions um, by only see, only focusing on a certain niche and certain types of plays. So you, you wake up in the morning, you have your daily routine, you do your workout, you feel centered, confident, uh, and then you open up your scanners and that's when the that confidence, because of your journaling and the data you've collected, you know what you're looking at based on the, the parameters, I guess, that you've set in your process. So then what's what's the next step? How do you how do you go from, you know, picking one of these stocks to actually jumping in and trading it? What's the first thing that goes through your mind? Is it the technical? Uh, a combination of both. Um, I'm probably behind my screens every day by like 6.30 a.m., maybe 6 a.m. So in the morning, I'll do a pretty uh, you know, I'll do enough due diligence to add to that confidence and conviction, you know, to to figure out which side of the trade I want to take, I guess. Um, but in terms of the in, you know, having the uh, instinct to enter a trade, that comes from seeing that pattern over and over again over the past couple of years and, um, and just knowing how that pattern plays out. I guess I could say the one thing I do journal and save is like I'm saving the one minute chart and the daily chart of like every stock that's moving on the day. Um, and then w when that same stock comes up, I'm going to see like how it tr traded back in March when it moves, you know? And these stocks have a personality just like we have personalities. So I think going back to the emotions, like certain stocks trade certain ways and you know, you know the way they trade if you've traded them, you know, before. Um, so when certain stocks pop up, I'll be a lot more confident trading certain ones than others because I've traded them before, you know, mm -hmm. if that makes yeah, any sense. It does. It totally makes sense. We do that as well. Um, in our room was we collect charts and charts and charts of the same patterns over and over again, just so that, you know, your brain can easily decipher the patterns, but then also you feel more comfortable with, with trading it. Um, but you mentioned the, the emotional aspect of things and how, you know, minimizing emotions, can be important, and so some one of, some of the community questions have been related to emotions. Uh, yeah. So I'll ask you one of the community questions: um, How do you manage emotions in a trade um, after a big win or a big loss? I mean, I thought about this before, before uh, throughout the day. This is a tough one to answer because the truth is that whether I have a red day or a green day, I'm pretty numb at this point. I say that to my parents, my brother, like I don't feel anything. And um, I've heard other traders talk about that. So I don't really have too much of an issue anymore. You know, I guess like. You've desensitized yourself. Yeah. And it has a, a pro and a con to it, I feel like, because sometimes you do feel emotionless. But like when I'm in a trade, my goal is to not think at all because all of my levels have been pre-established. Um, but I think, you know, when you're on a hot streak, I'm usually pushing it. And then, um, you know, when, when I'm on a cold streak, I'm usually sizing down dramatically. And, um, I think that you need to go through this roller coaster is what, is what really helps, you know, um, having the highs and lows because going back to emotions, you can identify like usually when I'm, I'm too arrogant or cocky on a trade is when I'm out because that's when I know my emotions are taking over, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but that's just because I've seen that happen to me in the past. And this is where like everyone's different. So it's, it's so hard to, it's easy to say it than to, to actually implement it, I guess. Um, everyone needs to go through the emotional roller coaster and then they'll be able to 
identify their own emotions and when they're becoming present. And then it's up to them whether they, they want to control it. Um, but I try and do the least amount of thinking when I'm in a trade at this point, um, as well as emotional thinking. I try and just remain as dumb as possible. And all my levels are pre-planned. And if it gets to a certain level, I'm going to do a certain thing. Or It's just a, if, if this then happens, then this happens scenario, which is kind of the way that algos work. Um, which most people think algos are super complicated, but it's just an if and then scenario, you know, which is a lot of trading. So that's what I really try and do to remove the emotions is trying to think like you're an algo. It's very helpful when you're, you've just had a big loss and you need to go into the next trade. I mean, the algos don't really care about what happened in the previous trade. Yeah. They just sort of, you know, do the same thing over, over again. And, and that's what we have to do as traders is, yeah. Te technically, we're supposed to not really think about what just happened and, you know, trade the next one in its own little vacuum. Yeah, I think I was laughing with a buddy that day because I said trading's really messed up because you're supposed to be as emotionally aware as possible, but also a numb yeah. <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I thought it's pretty funny. But it's true. It's like, um, I think a lot of successful traders are passive. And that's how I think I am. Like I'll take, I'll take a, a few thousand dollar loss and not care about it. Where most people will take it personally, you know. I still take it personally. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, but and that comes back to like just being human, you know, and the way that going back to like um, how we were raised, you know, is like kind of uh, the school system. This goes like a huge book that I like. I think you might have read it. Is um, the Inner Voice of Trading. Michael by Michael Martin talks about how we you know we were raised to believe that being wrong is bad so that's why we take losses and we take losses personally. <laughs> so let's do another question from the community uh, since we're on that same topic uh, and I think it's a good one. Um, I don't know that I would have an answer to this one, but do you have any psychological exercises to separate yourself from your ego? Yeah, so I think that this is part of my, this is like kind of Tony Robbins shit <laughs> in that like when I'm doing my morning cardio, I'll think about stuff I'm grateful and thankful for and um, just like appreciate the day and being alive. And um, I think that like starting your day out like that, I'm huge into this and starting with like a positive environment and think, really ask yourself what do you want out of this day before you even know what setups you're trading, you know? That's what helps me like get my ego in check. Um, like a good example is I, I went to Vegas for the first time for my brother's bachelor party in March. And like I, I woke up with like two hours of sleep, like th threw like a triple espresso down my throat and was like <laughs> trying to trade within 15 minutes and like lost like five grand within like 20 minutes. And that's when your ego, you know, I thought like I could just do this, right? I'm in Vegas, like I'll just whip, make a couple grand quick. No big deal, right? <sighs> And then, uh, <laughs> you know, so the before the I know it, I'm walking around, I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm walking around with a, a hot spot in my pocket throughout half the day, making sure I can all day fade this thing. And that thankfully made the losses back, but that's what happens. Um, when that morning preparation isn't there, my, you know, that's where I guess the ego comes in when you just think that, you know, that you're a pro and that you have it figured out, <laughs> which yeah. I still think I don't have it figured out. So. Well, it, it's, I find it really interesting. You know, a lot of people try to meditate or try to do things before the market opens. Um, and I and I think it's fantastic that they do it. But you have to find the right one that fits your own personality. Exactly. Exactly. You have to. And there's also something else that I find that when I don't center myself in the morning, like I've I'll, sometimes I'll do yoga in the morning or sometimes I'll yeah, just definitely. sit in the dark which is kind of silly. And if anybody walked in, I'd feel strange about it. But uh, the, 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 the idea is, uh, is that I, I feel that once I'm centered, I can, I can think more clearly and more rationally about what other traders in the market are thinking. You know, yeah. it's hard to put yourself in somebody else's shoes when you're not thinking rationally yourself. That's absolutely it, right? I mean, that's how I feel. And, you know, whether you do yoga or I'm doing morning cardio, it's just getting that, that, uh, that's, you know, being centered in self-awareness where you can think clearly. And I think that helps eliminate your bias, right? Like instead of being like, oh, I'm 
I'm going to short this stock. It's definitely way overextended. You know, maybe you should have thought about the long if you're thinking a little bit more clearly. Um, and I think that that definitely makes it's worked for me. And it's, there's a science behind it too. So I think, you know, but I've heard also some people can just wake up, you know, and uh, hmm. 20 minutes before the open and crush it. So it's each his own, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so I've got a, a tweet that I um, that I just copied down that really stood out to me. So maybe I'll just read the tweet and then you can talk about it. Um, so just to paraphrase, you said, remove yesterday and tomorrow from your subconscious thought and that that's an important skill for trading. Yeah. So every day is a new day in trading, which is why I love it. Um, and if you think about how great you traded yesterday or how horrible you traded yesterday, or like if you're worried about paying a bill tomorrow, which subconsciously you're thinking about tomorrow then, it's going to affect your trading today. So you need to basically approach each day as a new day and whatever happened yesterday, this is also helps keeping your ego in check. You know, whether you lo made five grand yesterday or lost five grand, you need to just be emotionally neutral today. Um, and that's basically what that means is you need to come to each day like it's its own. And uh, that's helped me trade better because otherwise, if you, that'll be anchoring is if you think about that, whatever you did yesterday, you're anchoring your thoughts to that day. And if you're thinking about that day, then usually that same thing will happen today, um, whether it be good or bad. And a lot of that goes towards, you know, being in full control of your own thoughts and your own, your own emotions, which I think we all strive for. Um, and do you openly talk about this stuff and, and work on this stuff with uh, traders that you're mentoring? Um, I would like to, I try to, but I, I try and keep it super basic at first. Um, and then when people have like specific questions, I try to elaborate on it. Um, but it's definitely something that I like to focus on because I think this goes back to like my whole belief with trading and it's, it's kind of proven your EQ versus your IQ, your emotional quotient versus your intelligent quotient. Um, they say that lawyers and doctors are the worst traders because they're overly analytical and they're usually high IQ, right? And um, to be a successful trader, you don't need to have a high IQ. I think you, if you put someone that has a high IQ against someone with a high EQ, I'd take the person with the high EQ every day of the week in trading. Um, so I think if you believe that, then you'll believe, you'll realize that, you know, you, you only have to look at a pattern or, and a chart so long to have an idea of where the risk reward is at that. The next step is, can you actually perform that, you know, and, and manage your emotions along the way. And that, that brings us to like almost perfectly into the next question from the community. Uh, what qualities do successful traders have in common? Yeah, that's what I said, mentioned before about them being basically they're passive. Um, they understand risk reward and excuse my French, but they have balls. <laughs> <laughs> Like my, my aunt always asks me all the time how do, how I do what I do, and I'll give her some elaborate explanation. Then she'll just say, it's because you have balls. <laughs> and th the truth is that it, it's a lot of it because um, being passive, as in you can, you'll take a loss and accept that you're early on a trade, but also with, with the same conviction and balls to know when you need to size back in, double or triple the size, you know, to make that loss back end some, you know? So like... I think that's why it's it's fine. It's tough to find one word to explain a trader, but I'd say that they're passive, but they're also convicted at the same time, you know? Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that uh, in the DMs people have asked me a couple of times uh, is, you know, how did you have such quick success? Because it seems like, you know, in the past three to four years, um, you've, you know, you've killed it. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about this before. And the truth is that I think, like you mentioned, how, you know, you traded a couple different uh, sectors like Forex and stuff. And, um, you know, before I started trading small caps, I traded uh, a lot of large cap, a lot of ETFs, a lot of options, um, IPOs, REITs, everything out there I basically dabbled in. And um, I realized that through having wins and losses that the market really doesn't care about you. So my whole strategy has been based off of like, I really rarely swing trade and I'm always cash overnight most of the time. Most of the time with an asterisk is, yeah, break the rules sometimes. <laughs> but um, 
I've seen the market, how it can move and how it can flip instantaneously. And that's what scares me the most. So I really try and minimize my, my overnight risk. And I think that's helped me stay alive where I've seen people take the overnight risk and it's not worth it. I think even most brokerage firms don't want the overnight risk anymore, hence the fees. So um, I guess I could say by strictly focusing on just day trading, finding a niche that I was good at and um, not trying to, to you know expand too much along the way because I see a lot of people. It's, it's one thing to exp expand your playbook, but it's another thing to um, try and do something you're, you know you're not good at, you know? And, you know, just trying to do something you're not good at is sort of the only way to know what you're good at. So it's sort of like yeah. a catch-22 <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, right. <laughs> How important is mentorship for traders that are developing, uh, in your opinion? Um, it's definitely important in terms of, you know, um, I've been the type of person where I, I'm a big believer in trial and error. So my first couple of years, I didn't really have much mentorship. Um, it was a lot of trial and error. Um, but in terms of like learning what else is out there, that's where I guess how we're talking is like Twitter, right? Like I started to see what other traders are doing and realizing that that's even possible or different types of strategies. And then that in itself is kind of a mentorship, right? With all, this, all the content that's being posted out there. So that's where I've kind of self-mentored. And now I kind of have a couple of buddies that I talk to that, you know, surrounding yourself with more of a community is going to be the mentorship. Like mentorship is a process. People think like, oh, I have like a, a two classes of mentorship. Like mentorship is almost a lifestyle and a process, you know, as opposed to like taking a class, you know? Yeah, actually, technically mentorship is supposed to be uh, like a mentor is somebody you don't pay. And somebody that has, you know, no, um, um, no skin in the game when it comes to tr teaching you what you're learning. Um, yeah. Whereas a coach is somebody that you'll pay and help you through a specific process. And I think the it, we're kind of backwards in our terminology. And I think it's important because a mentor is more of a friend or like somebody in your community that yeah. you know has no stake in you making or or losing money. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice distinction you make because it's the truth. I mean. The community is what you want to be, be surrounded with. And then, you know, I have a couple of buddies I talk to and we all, I guess, mentor each other and that we, you know, bounce ideas off and, you know, I'm having a, a low day or high day and, or they are vice versa. You know, we kind of uh, help each other, but, um, you know, I'm willing to also help people within our community that, um, you know, are looking to take that really take trading seriously, you know, cause that's what I find is a lot of people, unfortunately they want to get, get rich quick type of mentality, you know, and um, the mentorship should come in both ways where the students making the, the, the discipline and has the work ethic to do the data and journaling and everything you need to. And I think the mentors will just supplement that because I haven't had too much mentorship and I've had, you know, success as well. So um, I don't think it's definitely important and it'll probably help speed your learning curve, but it's not crucial. I think with the enough free content that's out there, you can definitely self teach if you have the discipline you know the discipline to become a trader is almost as important as it's a full-time uh, job i feel like a lot of lifestyle i feel like that's why i enjoy trading is because a lot of your discipline and thoughts in life and how you are in real life flows over into your trading so trading is a lifestyle as opposed to an occupation i feel like um you know dieting working out good having the balance like i found that you spend too much time behind the screens and not enough with your friends and family, you know, and then you get time with them. That balance is needed. So it's cool to see. That's why I enjoy it so much. It's a, it's really a lifestyle as opposed to a job, a job or a career. You know, you've, you've come so far in, in such a short period of time. What are you working on next for your own trading? Are you looking to continue increasing size? Basically? Um, yeah, that's my and, and how are you going about doing that? I mean, it's tough in this environment because this is the environment that you don't. <laughs> so now it's just about like summer trading. It's just, for me, it's the consistency, you know, the small gains. Um, it's definitely tough to start to increase size. This is where I personally start to reach out to people where the mentorship comes into play, where um, that plateau 
and um, I guess can be broken by talking to other traders and to figure out their thought process along the way. I think that's the sizing is the biggest hurdle for any trader um, because just because you're taking more size doesn't mean that you're doing it the right way. You know, the risk management needs to be just as as important um, at the same time as well. You know, in terms of your your price entries need to be just as crucial. And it's definitely a process which I'm personally, you know, it's a, a journey for me. Um, but this is where I've started to reach out to friends in the community that are definitely helping the process. Um, okay. Do you have any resources or anybody you need? want people to follow or, or anything like that to help people understand more about psychology and human behavior? Trading in the Zone, um, The Inner Voice of Trading by Michael Martin and The Disciplined Trader have really been the biggest ones for me. Um, you know, we have a, a training course at Foos, or that, that Foos made that's about psychology that I've, I've considered trying to make one in the future. But um, at this point, that's why um, I'd like talking about the psychological. It's tough to find a resource for it out there. Um, I think soon, you know, in the near future, in the next couple of months, something might be available. But um, as of now, that's why I like talking about it, to be honest. Okay, um, Mike, thank you so much for joining me on episode three of Bear vs. Pig. Uh, had a blast, talked about all things to do with psychology and human behavior. I uh, learned about a lot about you and your professional and personal background and where people can find you. Again, if you want to find Mike, you can follow him on Twitter. Um, at foos for mike um, and you can also check him out i'll drop some links in the article but where you can find him um, if you want to join his trading room or learn more about foos for appreciate it brother thank you for having me so that's it for this episode if you guys really enjoyed the content please uh, subscribe on youtube um, and then also follow me on twitter at dell the trader um, i post who's coming up next. And I also uh, give an opportunity for the community to submit questions for the next guest. And that way we can really make the most of our time with these successful traders. I've also received questions about myself. I do mention that I am an educator at activetraders.chat. Um, and uh, just to give you a quick rundown, I teach market auction theory, um, advanced order flow analysis and volume analysis. And we use that to trade the markets every single day in a live room where I share my screen, uh, much like a lot of the other traders that are joining us here on the podcast. Uh, so if you're interested to hear more about that, you can head over to activetraders.chat and join our community. And if you have any questions about who you'd like to hear next on the podcast or any comments, uh, you can message me on Twitter at Dell the Trader. And uh, please don't forget to retweet and really spread the word to friends and family about the podcast. It would help a lot. Thanks for listening.